Good morning, everyone. So we're having today uh, Lisa Leger from uh, the Financial and Consumer Services Commission. And we will be discussing and talking about fraud um, and how to flag uh, things like that um, in the future to protect yourself. Um, we will have, as we mentioned, the translation, uh, the interpretation in four languages. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will reply to that at the end. And if you, inter you experience any challenges during the uh, session, please let us know so that we can um, fix it. Thank you so much. Perfect. Oh, okay. well, thank you all for inviting me today. Um, okay. So if we can be aware of what they should be aware of what they should be aware of. So as was said, my name is Lisa Lazier. And I'm an education coordinator with... And what that means is anyone that works in industries that provide financial services or products, like, for instance, people selling things door to door, um, funeral providers, real estate agents, um, mortgage brokers, insurance companies. So people like that deal with those kinds of things within New Brunswick, they have to have a license or be registered with us. And that helps us make sure that they're real businesses. So this is what we kind of want to do to make sure that we can weed out or we can um, find the fraud uh, companies and make sure that the people that you deal with in New Brunswick are real companies. So part of what we do is education sessions like we're doing today. And like I said at the beginning, it's so that we can help people really be able to understand what to watch for and some of the common frauds that we see uh, happening within New Brunswick. So, my first question that I kind of had, and if people want to put it in the chat, that's perfectly fine. It's just a yes or a no answer. Um, I'm just curious to know people on the call, if they uh, have ever been a victim of a fraud. So if you've ever actually had a fraud happen to you. And again, I'll just give a, like a few, a minute or so for people to write into the chat yes or no. So I'm already starting to see some no's, which makes me very happy. And we're starting to find, we're starting to see a lot more of that, that people are starting to notice or watch for some of these signs already. And people are starting to talk more about fraud in general. And that's very helpful because again, if after you leave this presentation today and you talk to other people about what we talked about, that just helps us get more people to know the message. So it's like I said, very, very important uh, to get this stuff beforehand to make sure people understand um, what to watch for and, a way, and ways that we can stop it from happening uh, 
to begin with. So that's very, very important. And we're going to mention a couple of the different ways that we see. I'm seeing in the chat, some people have stuff with email, some by calls. Um, maybe you haven't been a victim, but you've received phone calls or you've received emails, and that's very, very common. We see that a lot. So the more that we can realize not to click on it, not to answer it, and some of the things we're going to talk about today will hopefully help with that. So the first one I want to talk about is Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada phone scams. So when we think phone scams in general, this is a common one that happens to people that are new to the country. And oftentimes, or a lot of the times, what we see in this, in this fraud or this scam is that someone will call your home and they usually will identify themselves by name or they'll say your name. So they've gathered some information on you and it could be from a variety of sources, which we're gonna talk about as the presentation moves on. But they'll call and they'll tell you that things like you didn't complete all your documents, uh, there's things with your passport that are wrong, uh, you may have, they might ask you that or tell you you're going to have to pay fees. Uh, they might even threaten you with being deported uh, or saying they're going to take your passport or you're going to lose your citizenship. So anytime you receive a phone call like this, chances are very, very strong that you're going, it's going to be a fraud. So again, I'll mention that one more time. Anytime that you get a phone call where they say anything about uh, your passport could be stolen or your passport could be um, taken from you, your, you owe money, you're going to be deported, anything like that, very, very likely that it's a fraud. Because in Canada, and New Brunswick, the government or the immigration will never call you and threaten you. That is never going to happen. So right away, you can know that this is likely a fraud. Some of the things that they'll also that they may also do is want you to act really quickly. So they'll tell you on the phone call that you have to pay this right away. You have to um, give me personal information right away. Those are what we call warning signs that are typical or usually seen in a fraud. Okay. So excuse me, Lisa, yeah. we have, we just have a, a, in the chat, Esther's asking, and I would ask too, if you could please slow down. Uh, I don't think you're giving the interpreters any chance to interpret. You need to oh, stop. I'm sorry. You need to stop after every little bit so they can interpret. Perfect. Okay. I thought you just meant talk slower in my sentences, but you mean pause between them. Yeah, they, they need time to interpret. Oh, perfect. Thank you for that. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you, Lisa. No problem. Okay. So where uh, whoever answered me a minute ago, where should I go back to, do you think? uh maybe maybe start right back at the beginning of explaining about the first common fraud that by our ircc perfect thank you very much no problem thanks okay so the first fraud i want to talk about is phone scams from the ircc and basically what you often see with this is they'll call you and threaten you. And the threatening can also include things like saying you're going to be deported, saying things like you need to pay fees immediately, or saying things like 
you could lose your passport or your citizenship. So it's very important to remember that this is not a real person from the government calling you. Whenever you're going to deal with the IRCC, it would likely be through a letter and no one would ever call you from that, that organization and threaten you. So that's one of the biggest things to keep in mind and remember is the fact that if you get a phone call from the IRCC and they're threatening, it's likely a fraud. Something else that I want you to remember from this as well is that if you get a phone call and you're worried about it, it's always best to call that business yourself. So what I mean by that is that if someone calls you and they say to you, call back this number or click here, click one to answer. It's really important to remember that you have no idea who you're calling back. Or and if you click or you answer somebody in a phone call, you don't know who you're, who you're talking to on the other end. But if you use a number that you have in your own records, so your own information about the IRCC, for example, and you call them, you're now in control of the situation. And you know that you're talking to the right organization. But when someone calls you, and you answer that call, you're not 100% sure who's calling you. So to help guard against fraud, it's really important to hang up right away and then call yourself with information that you have if you want to verify if something's wrong. And can someone share with me in the chat if that's a good speed now? Yes, I believe it's, uh, it's going smoothly now. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. The next one we want to cover is Canada Revenue Agency. So the CRA. And this is also can usually a phone scam. So a lot of these usually happen over the phone. But it's important to remember that you could have something like this in an email or a text as well. So much the same way that the immigration scam runs, the one with the CRA, is often someone saying you owe the government money. And usually they'll threaten that you're going to be arrested. So always again, remember, a government agency in Canada will never call you and threaten you in this way. And they also will never send you an email or a text message saying you owe them money or you're going to get arrested. So anything like that, likely a fraud. 
something to remember if you get emails and there's links in them to click on. You may click on a link. It might take you to a website. Chances are it's not real. So it's likely a fake website. And what they're trying to do is get you to enter personal information onto this fake site so they can get access to it. So again, one of the big messages here is to remember they're not, uh, the CRA is not going to ask you for your passport or any personal information. They're not going to demand you to pay anything, especially with things like uh, gift cards or e-transfers or ways that are outside using Canadian money. And again, they wouldn't ask you to do that over the phone or in an email. They'll never threaten you or leave you a threatening voicemail. And sadly, if they say to you, click on this link to get a refund, uh, that's also not true. I wish we could get free money, but that's not how it works. So if you see anything like that, definitely a scam. I want to share a story of something that happened to me to help kind of make sure everyone understands what I'm talking about with this. So during the pandemic, I received a letter from the Canada Revenue Agency. And that is how they would reach you. They would reach out in a letter. And it at, was asking for the last three addresses of where my adult son lived. because he was in university and they wanted some information about where he was living in another province. And on the paper, it had a space for me to fill it in. And it had an address where they wanted me to send the letter. So the first thing I did when I got the letter was I noticed at the top of the page, it said Canada Revenue Agency, and there was no logo. So there was no like graphic. And that was what I call a red flag. And when we say red flag, we mean like a warning sign. So I thought, hmm, I don't know if this is real. My second warning sign was the fact that they were asking me for information about my son that they should have already had because I always file my taxes every year. So since I had these two kind of questions in my mind, I realized that I should do some more research. So I went into my own records and I found the phone number to my accountant because they do my taxes every year. And I called her myself, so not from a number on the piece of paper. I called my accountant myself, and I told her about the letter. And since we were in a pandemic, I couldn't go see her. I had to just do it over the phone. But when I explained the letter to her, she had never heard of it either. So right away, 
she said, I'm going to look into it. So she asked me to take a picture and send it to her. And I did this through emails that I knew were hers. It wasn't from something I clicked on or found on the internet that I wasn't sure of or something that was sent to me. And a few days later, she called me back and she said, this was a real letter from the Canada Revenue Agency. So it wasn't a fraud. And the reason they wanted to know the information was because my son was eligible for some uh, credits for because he was a university student. So the reason why I'm sharing this story is that my letter wasn't a fraud, but if I was to just fill it in and send it to the address that was written on the letter, I don't really know with 100% certainty where that information is going. So by taking a few extra steps and doing some research and checking before I just send it in, I was able to make sure it wasn't a fraud. And this is the message I want to make to you all today is that if anyone asks you for personal information, email, through phone, through a text, um, even in a letter, take the extra time to make sure you know where it's coming from and that you know where it's going. So that's very, very important. And that's the big message of today is taking the time to make sure you know where your information is going. So now I wanna to touch on door-to-door -to -door sales scams. So a door-to-door -door sales, that means someone coming to your house to sell you something. And for instance, that could mean things like water softeners, um, testing your water, fixing your roof, paving your driveway, even offering you internet service. So anytime someone comes to your door to sell you something, they must be licensed with FCNB. And that's a rule or um, a law in New Brunswick. And by registering these companies, we make sure they, they have a criminal record check, we make sure they have the right education and qualifications to be offering the product or service that they're trying to sell you. Another thing that's important to remember in New Brunswick is that when you buy a product or service from someone selling door to door, that costs more than $100, they must provide you with a contract. And you're well within your rights to take the time you need to read it and understand it. Because it's so important to know exactly what it is you're agreeing to. So for instance, in the contract, it should say how long you have to pay it, if there's payment options every week, every month, if there's interest being charged, and how much the product or service costs 
overall. So including tax, including interest, whatever it is, the charge. So even when someone tells you, you only have to pay $100 a month, for example, they still need to say in the contract what the thing, the product or service costs overall. It's also important to remember that door-to-door -door salespeople are exactly that. They're salespeople. And their job is to sell you something. And if they're good at it, they're going to try to convince you to buy it. And sometimes they use what we call high pressure sales tactics. And that could include things like pushing you to sign right away, saying that um, you, you only have a certain amount of time, you have to buy it right now. So they wanna kind of make you agree to it right away without taking the time to think about what, you're, what you really need to do. And I noticed someone is saying something to note. I've heard that someone from TELUS has been going door to door in Fredericton and it's uncertain if he is legitimate. And you're right, that is a fraud that was happening in Fredericton um, that people have started to share. And that particular one, I don't know all the specifics, but I do know it involves someone saying they worked for TELUS and trying to get people to sign up for a phone plan and telling them it had to be with him and for them not to call TELUS themselves. So right away, again, that is something that is a warning sign because you always want to be able to check on that business. Anytime someone sells something to you at your home, there's a few things you should always do. One, do your own research on the business themselves. So go and look them up online, read reviews from other people, check them out on the Better Business Bureau and see if they're a real company. Two, take the time to read the contract. If you don't know what it means, you don't understand it, you need to have it interpreted, say. This is where I would definitely reach out to some other people that you know that might be able to interpret it for you and really understand what you're being asked before you sign it. I can't stress how important that piece is. Once you sign something, it is a contract. And then it's really hard to go back and say, I didn't want that. I didn't understand it because you already agreed to it. So taking the extra time to 100% be sure what you're being asked of is very, very important. Another thing to remember with people going door to door is that sometimes it's for charities. And when it's a charity, we at FCNB don't regulate that. That's something that's federal. And federal means it's the Canadian government, not the provincial government. But something you can do with charities is again, do your own research. They, they always have to give you their charity number. So they'll have like a, a, an authorization number, a registration number with the government. And you can go and call about this company and check those things yourself before you give any money to them. 
Another example that we heard of with door-to-door -door sales that was a scam was someone was going around saying they're going to check your house for mold and then would give the homeowner this fake report that said their house had mold and wanted to sell them a service to get the mold out. And they wanted to fix the problem and charge thousands of dollars. So again, it's different if you go and hire a company to come and do water testing or fix your roof or whatever the case may be. You've sought those people out. That's different than someone showing up at your door trying to sell you something. And lastly, on this topic, when I said they had to be registered with FCNB, they actually have to have a license. And this is what the license looks like. You can see on the screen. So the license should have our logo. It should have the name of the business, the address, the salesperson's name, and whatever it is that they're selling. And it should be signed by someone from FCNB. Now, I've had people say to me, well, how do you know if the license is real? Which is a very good question. And I encourage you to call FCNB if someone comes door to door selling and you want to be 100% sure who the company is, call us and we'll check for you as well. But I definitely want you to be asking people to see their license because that's another way for us to make sure that people that are selling door to door are actually registered with the province. So I have another question that I hope everyone can answer in the chat. And the question is, door-to-door -door sellers should have a license from FCNB to sell goods and services in New Brunswick. And I hope that you write in the chat true or false. So do you think yes or no? I'm seeing lots of trues. Excellent. That's exactly right. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we, I don't know if, if we can pass this question before it goes too far. Yeah. There was a question about, um, I've heard that someone from TELUS uh, has been going door to door in Fredericton and it is uncertain if he is legit. Yes, I answered that. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I can say it again if you want. No, it's good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. So I want to remind people, especially door to door, because it is something that we regulate with FCNB. Always make sure you check on this, on the all this information, and that you take your time to make sure you understand what they're asking you. I do see a second question that I can actually answer now before I go on to the next. It's gonna get covered as well through the rest of the presentation. But someone said, how do scammers get my phone number or name? And usually how this happens is social media a lot of the times. And on social media, we share a lot of information. And we really need to remember that everything we share online is available to the public. So for instance, if you go online and you fill out questionnaires or um, quizzes, that ask things like the first street you lived on, your teacher's name, your 
phone number when you were a kid. These things seem like just fun little quizzes, but scam artists can guess things from this. For instance, that might be a security question you have, or it might be a password. We share a lot our kids' names, our pets' names. We say where we were when, where we checked into places. So a fraudster might start to guess where you live, figuring out your address that way. So I want to be clear that I don't want people to be scared of social media. I just want people to realize that what you share, everyone has access to. Okay. So that's something that's really important to remember is that when we share things online, people can have access to it. When we're at a store and they ask you for your email, a lot of the times that happens. Let's say you're at Bath and Body Works and when you go to the cash to pay, they ask you for your email. Now, that's a real business and likely they just want it for marketing purposes. So they want to be able to send you uh, information when they have a sale, for example. So that's not fraud. But if their email list gets hacked and people get access to it, that's a way that sometimes fraudsters get information. Or if you give them your phone number and things like that. So to finish that first question about how do people get that information, a lot of the times it's that way. Also remember that if you get paper, so statements, um, bills, receipts, anything like that, and you put it in the recycling bin and you don't shred it or, or even burn it, again, you're not 100% sure where that information ends up. So I always encourage people, anything with your address, phone number, um, personal information, banking information, any papers that have that kind of stuff, you want to make sure you destroy it, um, either by shredding it or burning it is, are two good ways, instead of just recycling that kind of stuff. So that's another little tip to keep in mind. And this next question, how do I know if it's safe to send my information online for employment or banks? We're going to talk about that right now in the employment section here. And just the last thing I'll say about phone scams is if someone calls you and they keep wanting to talk to you, the longer you stay on the phone, there's more chance that you're going to tell them something you didn't mean to. And it could be as easy as your son walks by and while you're talking to the, to the person on the phone, you say his name. So now they know that information. So as soon as you can, hang up. And if you're worried, like I mentioned before, you call the company, the business, the organization yourself with information that you find, not information that was given to you on a phone call or an email or a text. So now when we're going into the employment scam section, this is where we're going to talk about information online for employment and banks and that kind of thing. So one scam that we heard a lot about, especially during the pandemic, was employment scams. And what would happen is they would say to people new to the country, I can get you a job, 
I can help get your family into Canada and give them a job. So it sounds like it would be great. But there's some um, things that they've been doing when they offer the job that are tips to tell you that it's a fraud. And one of them is they've often said just in an email that you didn't ask for that they're going to hire you right away. Always remember, especially in Canada, you're always going to have to have an interview. If it's a real business, they're going to want to talk to you. They're going to want to find out what your background is. No one is going to just give you a job on the spot. So if that happens, probably a fraud. Another thing that we heard happen is they would offer you the job and they would say to you, I'm going to give you a check to deposit to buy office supplies so you can work from home. And once you deposit the check, they want you to go and buy things and then give them back the difference. So whatever you bought, they want to, you to give them back the difference in the money. And they usually give you an account number. So the account isn't real. And as soon as they get access to your information, they've been, they go in electronically and they start taking your money out. So that's why it's so important to realize who you're giving this information to. So to answer the question that was in the chat, once you have a job, and you've been hired by a real company and you've gone through the process of starting your job, that's different to give them your information, say for your bank or whatever, because the job has already been identified as real. And again, you can check the company. You should be able to go visit it in person to at least see if it's real all of those pieces, or if it is like some kind of a, an at-home business, you still want to do your own research to make sure that the company is real. And that's very, very important. When you just answer an email that says you've been given this job, it kind of goes with everything else that I've said through the presentation. You don't really know where the information's going. So you want to be sure about that type of thing. The same thing goes with a bank. You want to be sure it's a real bank. You've checked online. You've called the company. But through information you've, you find, not information that came to you from an outside source uh, that you didn't ask for. So anytime something comes that you didn't inquire about on your own, those are definitely times you want to do some extra checking. Remembering the warning signs for employment, never they'll never send you a job offer without first wanting to interview you. And a real job isn't going to ask you to deposit a check into account and then give them money back. So things like that, business doesn't work like that here in Canada. So it's important for you to remember that. And if you want to look for a job, go to uh, sites or information that you know are legitimate, like the Government of Canada Job Bank. So remember that when you do a search on the internet and you're in control of it, you're way less likely to be clicking on something fraud that's a fraud than if they someone sends it to you. Because again, you don't know where that information came from. So I hope that that's pretty clear. I have two more things that I wanted to cover. I know we're getting really close to the end. Do I have time for that or should I pause?
Um, there are still 10 minutes, so. Perfect. So we I'm haven't cover... seen any other questions as well for now. Excellent. And, and, and I think it's fine if, uh, if, if you happen to go over, I think for most of us, we can, uh, the information is great. So uh, usually, usually if we go over, it's no problem. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I have just a couple of more things that I wanted to cover, but I wanted to be mindful of the time. So the next one is emergency scams or what we call grandparent scams. And this one breaks my heart. It's very, very sad. It happened in New Brunswick a few years ago and a new variation of this keeps seems to come out. So it's important that we pass the information on about this. And what was happening with the emergency one a few years ago was that the fraud fraudster or the scam artist was calling people. And again, they likely got your information from social media or somewhere else that you shared it. Um, and they were saying, that they had a loved one in an ambulance and before they could be treated, you had to give them personal information about that person. And again, that breaks my heart because the reason that the fraud happens is because they're scaring you to think that somebody is sick or hurt in your family. So it's so important to remember that in Canada, you're going to be treated at a hospital no matter what. If you get hurt and the ambulance takes you there, someone's going to treat the person before any information has to be given. So if someone says that to you on the phone, it's definitely a fraud. And what I tell people to do in that case, if that happens, is again, as scary as it is, because of course you're worried about your loved one, hang up and then reach out to someone who would know if that person is hurt or where they are, right? So you again want to do the reaching out. And, and always remember that that would ne wouldn't happen here. Someone is going to treat them at a hospital. The other spin on this was that people were pretending to be, in this case, grandchildren that are somewhere else and they're calling their grandparents asking them for money because they need help. And recently someone in New Brunswick um, fell victim because the person said that they were their grandson and they needed help to get um, back to Canada because they were stuck where they were because of COVID and they needed money to help get them out of the country to come back to Canada. So we've seen this happen with newcomers because your family members could be in another country. So it might be, um, I, we would say feasible, but it might be likely that they could call you and say something like that. And since they are in other countries, it doesn't sound like um, a fraud so much. And again, you wanna help your family member. But remember that again, hang up and contact someone who would know if that person is somewhere they shouldn't be or if they need help or wherever they would be. One tip that I have to help with this is to create a safe word. So what I mean by that is within your family, and even your extended family, um, you can find a word that doesn't mean anything to you. It's not connected to your family. It's not a birthday. It's not a special place. It's not an address. It's just a, a random word. So for instance, I'm, uh, I'm just looking around my house right now. Um, I'm, I have a glass of water. So let's say my, our safe word is glass. 
So glass doesn't mean anything. It's not, like I said, it's not a birthday. It's not anything attached to our family. But what you can do is when the caller calls you, you can ask right away, what's our family safe word? And if they don't know it, then that tells you right away that you're dealing with a scam artist. And usually they'll hang up at that point. So that's one thing that can help you know, with this kind of scam. But remember, always go back, hang up and go to the source. Go to someone who would know if that person was in trouble so you can verify if you're worried. Unregistered or unlicensed scams. Again, that's people that are trying to sell you things in New Brunswick that aren't registered with FCNB. I encourage you to visit our website. It's been on the screen most of the time and it'll be on the last screen that I put up. And it has lots of information about all the industries that we are responsible for. And finally, credit and debit card scams. This is the last thing I wanna cover. And I want to remind you, always keep that information safe. Your credit card has a PIN number, which is your personal identification number. And you never want to share it with anyone. Very important. You want to keep it safe. And you want to remember that if you get an email or a text, or a phone call saying there's a problem with your bank, there's a problem with your credit card, hang up, don't click on any links, don't call back any of the numbers they give you. Look on the back of your card. And on the back of your card, there'll be a customer service phone number. That's the number that you want to call to make sure that you're dealing with the company that gave you the card. So if you have any questions, that's where you wanna call. Because again, you know you're reaching the right company. But if I send you a text and I put a 1-800 number in it and you call it, I might say on the other end, if I'm a scam artist, that I am the bank. I, I can make up all kinds of things over the phone. And you have no idea if you're talking to the right person. But if you call the number on the back of your card, you know you're reaching the company that gave it to you. Another thing that's very important with credit and debit cards is when you use them to pay at a store. You can either go to the machine and type in your number when you put the card in, or you can do what we call the tap. And tapping is when you take the card and you swipe it over the machine and a beep happens and the money comes out of your account. So you don't have to punch your number in. And this feature was great during the pandemic so that we didn't have to touch the keypad. But now it's very important to remember that if your card is lost or stolen and I find it, I can go around and tap at all kinds of different stores and empty your account because I don't need your PIN number for that. Now the banks usually have a tap limit on your card. And what that means is that you can spend up to so much money, usually about $100, before you have to put your PIN number in. For example, if I go to a store and I want to buy something that's $120 and I wave the card to do the tap, if my tap limit is $100, 
the machine is going to say, no, you have to put your PIN number to complete this transaction. And that's a safety measure in place to help people from buying large purchases with your card. But again, if I take your card and I go buy things and I stay under the $100 limit, I can still empty your account. So it's very important to find out what your tap limit is. And you can do that by reaching out to your bank. And you can decide how high it should be. So you can decide if you want to lower it or you want it higher. You can decide those things. So I encourage you to check on that. And you can also, most banks will let you take it off altogether. And all that means is you always have to put the PIN number in. So it's another good safety feature to keep in mind. Always remember to never share that information. Keep your card safe and report it if it's ever lost or stolen to the company that gave it to you so they can put a pause on it and do what they need to, to, to make sure it doesn't get uh, any of your money gets lost or stolen from it. The last thing I want to say about using cards is I had someone say to me in a previous presentation, how safe is it to buy things online or give someone my credit card number over the phone? And I'm going to use an example to help illustrate this. Let's say during the pandemic, lots of us bought things over the phone and online. And let's say we wanted to buy a barbecue at Canadian Tire. So we call Canadian Tire and we talk to the person on at, you know, that answers the phone and we tell them the barbecue we want and we give them our credit card number to buy it and we show up and they bring it to the car because we have like curbside pickup. And that was a very common during the pandemic. So we didn't have to be in the store. So that's relatively safe. Yes, you did give your information to the person who worked at Canadian Tire, but you called Canadian Tire yourself. You knew you were, you were talking to them and you, were, you gave them the information. It's a big company. It's, like, it was, it's likely fine. Of course, there's always a bit of, of risk because you gave it to the person that works there. But for the most part, that would be relatively safe. Now, let's say you got an email that says it's from Canadian Tire and they have a sale on barbecues. And in the email, they want you to click on something to go to the sale and put your credit card number in to buy it. This is where you're starting to get more risky. Because again, you didn't ask Canadian Tire, they, somebody sent it to you. This is where you're never sure where you're clicking and where you're gonna end up. This is what I'm talking about when we wanna be careful about credit and debit cards. And the same thing for online shopping and even online banking. You really want to be doing those things on a home network, not on public Wi-Fi, because those are places where people can um, get access to your information when it's public. So you don't want to be going on those kinds of sites when you're uh, in public. And you want to be sure of the company that you're dealing with and where your information is going and if they have safety measures in place. So you want to be looking for security measures on the website. And I'm going to share one little thing for you to see on, um, on the website, on a website that I want you to watch for when you're looking for, I'm going to bring up a, a, a website here for you to look at. And I'm going to point out a couple of things that you can look for. So 
So let's say I bank with Scotiabank. So I'm going to search for Scotiabank. So typically the first um, address that comes up is probably the top ones are likely the right um, places. And when I click on this link, and again, I'm not connected to Scotiabank, it's just an example. There's a few things that I want you to realize. One is this little lock picture, okay? So on the little lock, that tells you that there's security measures in place. Another thing to look for is if you look at the address bar, it should say HTTP with an S. And the S means there's security measures in place. So looking for those two things right away helps make sure you're on a secure site. It still doesn't mean that it's perfectly without risk, but if you don't see those things, for sure, there's a lot of risk to put in personal information. So those are two things very important to look for. The last thing you want to check as well is the address itself. Does it match the company? Sometimes fraudsters will change one letter or one symbol. And if we don't look clearly, we'll, we're not sure if we're on the right site. So we want to make sure that way as well. Okay. And then as far as using your credit card online, two things that I recommend or that I would suggest is one, making sure again, you're on a reputable site, you're on a real site. If you've clicked a few times, you don't know where you are anymore, you're not really sure about where your money, where your information is going, I would probably caution against it. So really think about in the, in the end, do you know where this information is going? And if you don't think it's safe, I would probably caution against doing it. The other thing you want to remember when you're dealing with online shopping, uh, I guess in general, is again, looking at the security information and also having, if you're going to do it, have a card with a lower limit. So sometimes people have credit cards with very high limits. So maybe have one card with a lower limit that if something happens and somebody uses all the money on it, it's not as big of a loss as trying to use a, a big car card with a lot of limit on it. That's something else to kind of keep in mind is that if somebody does access this card, how much money could I potentially lose? So keeping that in mind. And lastly, thinking about third party, um, I guess, companies that can protect your information. One example, and again, it's just an example, is if you use something like PayPal, how PayPal works is that they have your credit information and then anything you buy through it, they pay for it through your card, but that secondary company doesn't get your information. It all stays within that one place. So that's an extra security kind of measure that can help. There's always a bit of risk whenever you give personal information on a website or over the phone. You have to kind of think about how much risk you're willing to take. And again, where the information is going. So I've come to the end. I know I'm 15 minutes over. I wanted to put up our contact information. Um, the big one is our website. If you can remember fcnb.ca, then you can get to all the other information that's there. Um, I hope that some of the things we've shared today will help you, that you'll start thinking about all of these things before you give your information. And I thank you again for inviting me. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Hopefully we'll create 
more awareness and uh, safety for everyone. Um, Absolutely. If, um, so if anybody has any other questions to address. Oh, I see one that came up and I can answer it. You post, yeah. Do you post scams on your Facebook? We actually do. We have what's called um, consumer alerts. And we post anything that comes up that we hear about in New Brunswick, we post on our social media sites. And you can also go to our website and sign up to get the alerts. So every time one happens, we'll send you an email that tells you about it. I've had someone say to me once before, well, if I sign up for that, how can I be sure it's safe? Which is an excellent question. And something to remember is if you get something from FCNB, we're never going to sell you anything. It's just going to be information. So if you ever get an email that says it's from FCNB trying to sell you something, then you definitely know it's fraud. So if you sign up for our alert, it's just to let you know, oh, this is happening in New Brunswick right now. That's great. Thank you everyone for your participation. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know if I, I'm I'm just have one second. I just want to share something on my that's on my screen. Sure. Um, now that classes are here, I'm sharing this is something that's coming up on Saturday, June 4th. I thought that I would share it here, the heritage walking tours, urban uh, sketching, those activities that are happening so that if people who are attending the session would be interested in participating that would be a good opportunity for everyone to join new things in the community. Perfect. Well, thanks again for having me. And I think we're going to do it again here in 15 minutes. Yes, so we will have a French uh, presentation next. So anyone who is uh, doesn't have any more questions, you are most welcome to um, go back to your activities and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks, Arabelle. Nice to see you. Thank you, same. <laughs>